with a round of applause, Dr. Naomi Orizquez, Professor University of California, San Diego. Her topic is, who is responsible for climate change? Let's welcome Dr. Naomi Orizquez. Merchants of Doubt, 
I need to get a copy of the Chinese cover to put here. It's been recently published in Simplified Chinese, um, so maybe you can get a copy of it. But in my work with Eric Conway, my co-author, we were focused on the question of why the United States had been so resistant to taking action on climate change, and in particular, why there were very strong groups in the United States who challenged the scientific evidence and who claimed that we didn't even really know whether or not climate change was happening. So a campaign to challenge and undermine scientific knowledge. And that was our focus in the book. Who were these people, and why would they doubt the scientific evidence accumulated over more than 100 years by distinguished and very famous scientists? So later in the talk, I'll say a little bit more about that. So here our focus was on the question of who was responsible for preventing political action on climate change. Today I want to look at the question of responsibility a little bit more broadly. Next slide. So the question is today, who is responsible for climate change? And what I'd like to think about today with you is the question of whether or not the concept of responsibility could be a helpful one, a useful concept for helping us to move forward in terms of action, in terms of thinking about what we could do as individuals, as a nation, as a university system, as part of an international community of scholars, in terms of moving forward on this issue. Next slide, please. So for most people involved in the question of responsibility, the issue of climate change has a strong beginning or starting point in 1992. That is when world leaders met in Rio de Janeiro, in Brazil, and signed the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. The Framework Convention, like most political documents, is very long, but the key part of it, from the point of view of climate change, is that it commits the nations who have signed it, who are parties to the convention, to preventing what was called dangerous anthropogenic interference in the climate system. That is to say, dangerous interference by humans, by mankind, by people. Next slide. Currently, there are 195 signatories to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, so all of the world's major nations, plus many smaller countries, including the United States and the Russian Federation, are all signatories. It includes, as I said, the United States, the Saudi European Arabia. Union, also Saudi Arabia, but not Taiwan because of the United Nations framework. Next slide, please. Now, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change is very interesting for anyone who is interested in the relationship between science and policy, because the framework explicitly relies on and invokes a science-driven framework. That is to say, science is built in to the structure of this policy instrument. And in particular, the crucial part is Article 2, which is where this phrase, dangerous anthropogenic interference, comes from. So Article 2 commits the signatories to the convention to the stabilization of greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere at a level that would <coughs> prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. So the aim is to avoid danger, and the way to do it is to stabilize greenhouse gases at the concentration that would prevent this danger. Well, what is that concentration? Next slide, please. Well, first of all, sorry, let me back up. What, what do they mean by dangerous anthropogenic interference? How do we understand danger in the context of the Framework Convention. Many cr critics of the United Nations, critics of the Framework Convention, have said that danger is a very ambiguous concept. What one man <coughs> thinks is dangerous, another woman might think is fun. Some people think it's fun to jump out of airplanes. Personally, I think it's fun to climb mountains, but my mother thinks it's very dangerous. So danger is a subjective concept. Danger has a great deal of culture, cultural and social um, quality. What's considered dangerous in one culture may be different than another. What's considered dangerous by one person might be different from another. 
But nevertheless, the fact is that the United Nations Framework Convention defined what they considered dangerous to be in this context. And that was anything, any interference, any changes in the climate system caused by people, interference, that threatened biodiversity, food production, and sustainable economic development. So I think that's quite clear. Obviously, all of us understand the significance of food production. Most of us understand the significance of biodiversity, although not all. Many people actually don't, in my experience. And I think most of us understand the concept of sustainable economic development, although that, too, has been challenged and questioned in different ways. Next slide, please. So again, let's look closely at exactly what the Framework Convention says about this question. The objective, the ultimate objective of this convention and any related legal instruments that the Conference of Parties may adopt, so for those of you who are not familiar, after the UN Framework Convention, a legal structure was set up known as the Conference of Parties, also sometimes known as COP, and there's been a set of meetings of this Conference of Parties ever since. The Kyoto meeting was the one that led to the Kyoto Protocol, most recently, COP met in Doha, and many of you know about that meeting. So the ultimate objective is to achieve, in accordance with the relevant provisions of the convention, now here's the phrase we already saw, stabilization of greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere at a level that would prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. Now, here's the definition of danger. Such a level should be achieved within a time frame, so time matters, sufficient to allow ecosystems to adapt naturally to climate change, to ensure that food production is not threatened, and to enable economic development to proceed in a sustainable manner. So this is very interesting because it tells us that the United Nations parties were not thinking that climate change had to be stopped completely. They already understood that that might not be an achievable goal, but that it should be achieved within a time frame to allow ecosystems to adapt naturally. And that's very interesting because what it's essentially saying is that the challenge we face is the rapidity of anthropogenic climate change. What we are doing now is changing the climate on a rate that is too fast for most natural ecosystems to adapt to. And that is partly why there is such a profound threat to biodiversity, because many species will not be able to adapt to these changes without potentially going extinct. It's also one reason why climate change is so worrisome in certain respects, because if you stop and think for a moment, what organisms on Earth do we know adapt extremely rapidly? Anyone care to say? I'm sorry? Virus. Virus, right. Viruses, bacteria, some insects, mosquitoes that carry malaria. Many of the insects that carry disease vectors adapt very rapidly. What organisms adapt slowly, as far as we know? Humans. Humans, right? People, <laughs> elephants, tigers, polar bears. Many of the things we love and value, many of the beautiful fauna, the giraffes of Africa, the tigers of India, us, large creatures tend to adapt rather slowly. They tend to evolve slowly. They have long generation times. Bugs, viruses, bacteria tend to have short generation times, adapt rather quickly. So this means that viruses and bacteria may thrive in a changed climate. But people and polar bears and tigers and elephants and giraffes will likely not thrive. So, as I've said, this is a science-driven framework. It relies on the work of scientists to answer questions about the level, the concentrations of greenhouse gases, and the rate at which climate change may be taking place. So the presumption built into this policy instrument is that scientists, researchers at universities like the University System of Taiwan, would determine the level, the concentration of greenhouse gases, 
and that the world would then act upon that scientific information. Next slide, please. So, for the last 50 years or so, climate change has been framed and interpreted in this way, primarily as a scientific question. Is climate change happening? Is it caused by human activities? What will the effects be in the future, and how rapidly will they occur? And what, if anything, can be done, technically, to stop or slow dangerous anthropogenic interference, including that question of what is the level of greenhouse gas concentrations that would prevent the AI? Next slide, please. So as a historian of science who has studied the progress of scientific research, I would say that scientists have largely answered these questions. So I'd like to take a few minutes now for any of you who are not familiar with the scientific work just to briefly sum up some of the major findings that do in fact answer these fundamental scientific questions. Next slide. First of all, the most basic question which many people around the world still wonder about is human-caused anthropogenic climate change happening? Next slide. The answer to that question is clearly yes. Scientists have worked extremely hard in the last 20 to 30 years to try to understand historic temperature records. That is to say, to analyze the available data that we have, measurements of temperature that humans have been collecting for more than 100 years. And these data very clearly show that, of course, there are ups and downs. We know that some years are cold and some years are hot. But overall, the mean global temperature has increased. It has increased about 1 degree centigrade over the past 100 years. And most of the sort of dramatic uptick in temperature has occurred in the last 50 years. And this, of course, corresponds with the great increase in use of fossil fuels in the last 50 years, pretty much since the end of World War II. Next slide, please. Now, of course, we could have an increase in global temperature, and it doesn't mean that we know what's causing it. The fact of temperature increase is different than the understanding the cause, but of course scientists have spent considerable effort trying to understand the cause, or what they sometimes refer to as attribution studies. That is to say, to what can we attribute this observed temperature increase? Next slide, please. Well, one way scientists have tried to do that is to try to put the recent increase into a larger geologic historic context. That is to say, if we just look at the past 50 years, we're looking at this spike here shown in red. But if we put together data going back further, sorry, this is cut off here, but this is about the year 1000 there. So we have a millennia of temperature data here. And what we see is what's come to be known as the hockey stick curve. And this curve was given a lot of prominence in the third assessment report of the IPCC. So what we see again, a lot of natural variability. Uh, we have the Little Ice Age in Europe here, although interestingly enough, a lot of fuss has been made about the Little Ice Age, but the Little Ice Age was not in fact a global phenomenon, it was mostly in Europe. Uh, so a lot of up and down, a lot of uncertainty, the gray zone represents the uncertainty surrounding these calculations, uh, but nevertheless, overall, you can see a relatively stable climate for most of the last millennia, and then it begins to increase uh, after the Industrial Revolution. This is 1850 here, so we begin to see coal use in Europe, um, some ups and downs in the middle century. We can talk about that if people are interested. And then, again, this big dramatic spike with very little down, almost all up, in the last 50 years. Now, this work has been strongly criticized in the United States particularly, by people who are skeptical of the scientific evidence. So one, and particularly they've criticized the IPCC. They sometimes like to call this a United Nations document, which of course is silly because it's not a United Nations document, it's a scientific graph. But it's important to know that it's not, this is not just 
the work of one person, or one, even one laboratory, there have been many different investigations of this question by scientists in many different parts of the world, including in the United States, in Europe, HCA is the Hadley Center in the United Kingdom. Uh, and these reconstructions, these are all northern hemisphere reconstructions. We have much more data from the northern hemisphere, mainly because there's more land mass in the northern hemisphere. So each of these different colors represents a different independent temperature analysis, in some cases using different techniques like ice cores or tree rings or coral reef isotopic temperature analyses. And you can see that the results are somewhat different depending upon what technique you use. That's to be expected in scientific research. But what's most interesting about this graph is that you see that even despite the variability in the noise in this data here, all of it shows that compared to a baseline, this is an 1880 baseline, the world was much cooler for about a millennia than it is now, and all of them show the same pattern of a very dramatic uptake that begins around the time of the Industrial Revolution in Europe. So these data are very, very clear. And of course, we know what happened during the Industrial Revolution. People began to burn fossil fuels in large quantities and to add carbon dioxide to the Earth's atmosphere, carbon dioxide that was not there before. Next slide, please. Now, because I've lectured a lot around the globe, I've gotten used to the sort of questions that people have about these data. And so one question that comes up is, well, a thousand years, you know, in the course of geological history, it's still not a lot of data. And that's true. And people often sometimes say, we know that the Earth's climate has varied a great deal during the course of geological history. And that is also true. So the question comes up, can we put... So we put the 100 years in the context of 1,000 years. Can we now put that 1,000 years in the context of a million years? And scientists have done that as well. And the results are extremely interesting. So most of the data that we have that pushes back the temperature record to a million years, and this chart shows it going to um, 700,000, but there is now data going back to almost 1 million years. This, these data come from ice cores either in Antarctica, the so-called Vostok ice core, originally drilled by the Russians, and then also data in Greenland collected by American, European, and uh, particularly Danish researchers um, in Greenland. So what do these data show us? Well, these data show us that if we go back half a million to a million years, we do see this is the carbon dioxide concentration of the atmosphere based on carbon dioxide preserved in bubbles air bubbles trapped in ice that can be drilled in Antarctica and Greenland from the ice sheets. And what these data show is that the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has varied. And it has typically varied from a level of about 180 parts per million to as much of a, as about 300 parts per million. The average value for pre-industrial carbon dioxide based on ice core data is about 290. So it's about up here. And you can see this value here. However, at about 100 years ago, so in this very last piece of this, we begin to see the CO2 concentration rising. So from about 290 or 270 maybe, 275, it begins to <coughs> go up and up and up. And this is where we are today, just below 400 parts per million. So the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere today is unprecedented over the course of the last million years. And that strongly tells us that there is something going on that is different than the natural variability that we see in the geologic record. Next, please. If we then superimpose this last thousand years on this chart here, this spike here is this spike here. So we see that we can put this chart here and put it in this much larger context. Next slide. So, oh, I was going to say one other thing. Could you just go back for one moment? I, I forgot to include a slide about this, but we can also analyze the isotopic composition of the carbon dioxide. And what we see is that the carbon 
13 concentration of this carbon dioxide is very different than this carbon dioxide. It's very depleted in carbon-13. And that tells us, uh, and if anyone has questions, I can talk more about that later, that tells us that this carbon dioxide has had to come from an organic source, such as burning wood or fossil fuels. Um, and it cannot have come from volcanoes because it would have a different isotopic composition. Uh, this carbon dioxide may have come in part from volcanoes or degassing of the oceans, but this carbon dioxide comes from organic carbon sources. Next slide. So we know that the climate has changed. We know that there's been a dramatic change in the last 50 to 100 years. We know that dramatic change has been directly correlated with an increase in carbon dioxide. We know that that carbon dioxide has come from burning wood or fossil fuels, or peat, or deforestation. And we know that correlates with the Industrial Revolution. So all of the pieces of that puzzle fit together. But what about the future? Much of our concern about climate change is about the future. It's about what the effects will be. And of course, as Niels Bohr once famously said, the it's very, prediction is a very difficult thing, especially about the future. So we know that the future is much less certain than the past. But nevertheless, there's broad agreement that unmitigated warming will lead to significant disruption. And scientists agree about these in large part because virtually all of these things are already happening. So the future is actually now. The future is here. Many of these things were predicted 50 years ago. And 50 years ago, they were just predictions. Now many of these predictions are coming true. And so when we look to the future, what we can say with confidence is that these changes will continue and get worse. So absolutely unambiguous, probably the one thing that every climate scientist I know agrees about is sea level rise. Sea level rise is already accelerating compared to what it was, say, 100 years ago. And it will continue to accelerate based on the simple, basic physical principle of thermal expansion. When you heat water, it expands. And that's something that anyone who took high school chemistry or physics knows. So it's basic physical principles, and there's no known mitigating factor that would prevent sea level from rising through basic thermal expansion. In addition, there's additional sea level rise caused by the melting of continental ice in Greenland and Antarctica, uh, and also um, continental glaciers in the Himalaya and Switzerland. And this is also contributing to additional sea level rise. Sea level rise is worrisome for the obvious reason that hundreds of millions of people around the globe live within one meter of sea level. Most of the major cities of Europe and North America are at sea level. Where I live in San Diego, my house is uh, 13 feet above sea level, <laughs> uh, three, four meters. Uh, many of the world's great historic monuments are at or very close to sea level. Many of the places that people go to visit as tourists, places like Venice, are at sea level. So there's enormous economic, social, and cultural value sitting around the globe at sea level. In addition, when sea level rises, it increases the risk of storm surge and coastal erosion associated with storms, typhoons, hurricanes, cyclones. So all of these are phenomena that are already occurring and will almost certainly become worse. Extreme weather events. Again, the science behind extreme weather is very complex. Many of my scientific colleagues get a bit tongue-tied when they're asked about these questions because they understand in their guts how complicated extreme weather events like typhoons and cyclones are. And yet at the same time, if we back off the details and the complexities, one of the things we know is that when you put more energy in a system, that energy has to go somewhere. Conservation of energy, one of the most basic scientific principles there is. When you put energy into the climate system, it goes into weather. It goes into storms. It goes into extreme weather events. And again, we already have substantial evidence that at least some extreme weather events around the globe are becoming stronger. <coughs> 
Droughts, wildfires, and heat waves are obvious consequences of a warmer world overall. And again, these matter because they kill people. People die in heat waves and fires. And also because heat waves and droughts lead to crop failure. So the issue of food security becomes significant here. Loss of biodiversity we've already talked about, particularly in the high Arctic regions and at high elevations where organisms may be at the limits of their habitats. And then finally, the issue of the loss of Arctic sea ice, which is probably the clearest example of where there will be major cultural losses, as whole groups of people are already seeing their livelihoods threatened by the loss of sea ice and also a more speculative anxiety about the impacts that that could have on ocean circulation. So we have a range of potential impacts from things that I think we can say are essentially even beyond any reasonable doubt, to things that are more speculative but still sources of substantial concern. Next slide, please. So what, if anything, can we do to slow or stop these changes? Next slide. Well, the basic idea behind the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change is to reduce and ultimately eliminate the greenhouse gas emissions that are the primary drivers of climate change. And this is what led then to the Kyoto Protocol to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change negotiated by the Conference of Parties in Kyoto. The Kyoto Protocol defines specific quantitative targets for greenhouse gas reductions among the Annex I nations. Now, this is a very important concept, and I'll say more in a minute, because Kyoto initially focused on the so-called Annex I, or wealthy and highly industrialized nations. Kyoto did not compel all of the nations of the world to cut their greenhouse gas emissions, and I'll say more in a moment why. So the and in, and in fact, Kyoto actually permitted some nations to increase their greenhouse gas concentrations. So if you look at the targets specified, we see that Germany, for example, had a target of cutting 20%. Greece was allowed to increase 25%. And this is all relative to a 1990 baseline. So relative to the a baseline that was based on the latest available data at the time of the ad adoption of the UN Framework Convention. Next slide, please. <clears throat> but here's where the issue then becomes, begins to become much more complicated. As complex as the climate system is, the world economic and political system is that much more complicated. And reducing greenhouse gas emissions is not primarily a scientific problem. It has scientific components. It certainly has technological components in terms of converting our energy system. But it is also a political problem because it involves agreements among nations and different parties, treaties, conventions, protocols, trade agreements. And it's also a social problem, as we've seen particularly in the United States, because if you want to do any of these things, you need political and cultural support. And the social dimension of support for action on climate change, it seems to me, is a very understudied element. Next slide. So this brings us then to the question of responsibility. Many of the climate scientists I know feel a great sense of responsibility. And many of them have taken a great deal of time over the last 10 or 15 years to try to communicate and explain the problem of climate change Many of them have taken huge amounts of time to participate in the IPCC process. Uh, and here's just a picture of some people whose research I've studied. Uh, Jim Hansen today has a newsletter, I just got his latest edition today, in which he uh, is trying to speak very forcefully now about what the world needs to do about climate change. But these scientists were involved primarily in defining the problem, articulating the problem, and explaining the evidence, compiling and explaining the evidence that I've just showed you. But if the issue is not so much defining the problem as fixing it, then responsibility begins to shift. And so one question that comes up is, to whom? 
who is now responsible for doing something about climate change? Next slide. So that's just about my time. I wonder if I could just lay out some ideas, and then tomorrow we'll go into more detail about the different ways of thinking about it. Next slide, please. So there are many different ways we could address this issue, but it seems to me that there are at least five that we might want to think about and talk about here in the next two days. So one obvious possibility is governments. And indeed, over the last 20 years or 25 years since the UN Framework Convention, governments in the form of nation states have been the principal actors, well, people in my community sometimes call state actors, so nation states, involved in the negotiation and discussion of climate change. The UN Framework Convention, by virtue of being a convention, by virtue of being a treaty among nation states, necessarily focuses on the role of governments, national governments, in addressing the issue. But of course, that's not the only way we could look at it. We could also think about government on other scales, such as regional governments, regional trade agreements, uh, state governments, provincial governments. Tomorrow I can say a little more about that, but my own state, the state of California, has adopted a law to reduce greenhouse gas emissions that commits us to a 20% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2020. So essentially, making California behave as if it were a party to the UN Framework Convention. And that's a very interesting move because there are 33 million of us in California, more than here in Taiwan. So in a sense, we could argue that California is like a state. It's a very big economic, political, and social entity. And what we do in California matters just as it matters what you do here in Taiwan. We could also think about the people who have interfered with action and delayed action, such as the ones that Eric Conway and I wrote about in our book. We could talk about the producers of fossil fuels. There's been relatively little discussion of the responsibility of petroleum, gas, and coal industry. And yet, we might argue that since these are the groups that have produced the fossil fuels that continue to drive climate change, Surely they must have some responsibility in this picture. Then there's the larger business community. What is their responsibility to help us develop alternative technologies and energy efficiency? And then, of course, the obvious question about all of us. And I think that ultimately any large social or ethical problem invariably means we all have some responsibility. But tomorrow I can talk a bit more about some more than others, because the reality is that some citizens on this planet use far more energy and produce far more greenhouse gases than others. And to say that we are all responsible, I think on one level is correct and empowering and a positive message, but on the other hand, can also tend to hide the fact that some of us are much more responsible than others. So let me stop there, and I'm glad we'll have more time tomorrow because I have much more to say. <laughs> Thank you.